What is up guys, my name is B-Mask and we're back to scaling the Scoobyverse, part 68, the Boo Saga. Uh, there have been so many debates about power scaling and power levels on the show, especially since Scooby Super started airing, and I feel things used to be a lot simpler back in the day. Uh, nothing was more legendary in the Funworks Android Saga than when Norville Rogers reached his true power and obliterated Perfect Charlie, it's so cool. But I feel like they jumped the shark in this season, once Freddy sacrifices his van in order to become one of the Majin. Uh, coincidentally, this is also the saga where people got the common misconception of Jinkies being so powerful when Jeepers is clearly of much greater value. Nah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm not gonna do that. You, you gotta stop thinking in anime. Well, here we are again. After making that first Scoobyverse video, I thought I was done, covering all of my favourite takes in one stroke. Bam, subject terminated, time to move on. Who knows what could have been next? Wurzel Gummidge analysis, Desperate Housewives retrospective, Twix history, ah, sky's the limit. That would have been it if I hadn't gotten a bunch of comments telling me everything else I should have included. People gushing about their favourite shows, movies, it kinda put the sheer scope of Scooby in context, and I guess I couldn't ignore the challenge of trying to cover them. It's, uh, what Freddy would want. Brilliant. American literature, and I don't care what anybody, it is, it's lit, it should be taught in schools. The last video was about how Scooby has changed over the years, scaling its core values up and down to create different effects, but always keeping the same appeal, my list of essential Scooby viewing. In taking on the requests, scanning the archives for stuff I'd forgotten, as well as thinking about the recently released big budget animated movie, there seemed to be a pattern emerging about all these projects, and whether or not they have anything interesting to add. Some do, some don't, some big poo poo. If not about Scooby's appeal, then this one is about Scooby's relevancy, a bunch of projects commenting on his place on our screens, and indeed in our culture. Yeah, I think I can get away with that. So buckle up as we drive deep into wider Scooby lore. No matter how big or small they may be, all versions are celebrated here today equally, treated with the respect and love they deserve. Except get a clue. Because that one sucked. Yes, it's Hmm, this was strange. Turns out I've been lied to all these years, if we're to take Scooby Goes Hollywood as true canon. This TV special reveals that the Mystery Gang are actors, or uh, people playing themselves on the fictional Scooby-Doo show, it's uh, it's not very clear, where Shag and Scoob decide to quit and pitch audition tapes to an executive in the hopes of broadening their career opportunities. Uh, yes, that's the plot. So what we get for the bulk of the runtime are a bunch of genre parodies, as Scooby tries on many different hats and wait, are we- <laughs> okay, are we doing this? <laughs> oh, what? No! <laughs> <laughs> I had to pause for a while after that one. This was a charming little oddity, and unexpectedly funny too. While an excuse to spoof a bunch of timely shows and movies, which uh, ain't so timely anymore, a lot of them and the general comments on the industry are broad enough to hold up, and offer an absurdist appeal by simply existing. <laughs> Fun Scoob. It's got that 70s obsession with fusing show tune culture and funk, uh, quite a bit of that at the time, I ain't complaining. Was shocked to see some of the animation looking this decent so close to the 60s show, as well as an angle I'd never seen them try before. That Shaggy's an absolute toad. He's the one who puts the idea of quitting into the dog's head, all to boost his own career. Casting Shaggy as the Tom Parker to Scooby's Elvis, well, suddenly a lot of things make sense. I soon realised this was trying to tell me something, which made it an unintentionally great way to make the point I wanted for the video. The special aired in 1979, which means it was Scooby's 10th anniversary. Viewership had been declining and there was a huge effort to revive the brand given how much money it used to make, this being part of that. It's why, that same year, Scrappy was introduced, an attempt to shake up the classic Scooby formula and increase viewership, which worked, and while many Scrappy apologists tried to spin this as making that character necessary, I found his lasting impact on the generation who remember him speaks for itself. Scrappy dude, someone needs to get a bloody magnum and <laughs> Anyway, point being, I think Scoob Goes Hollywood has the better solution, one that's aged shockingly well. As Scoob tries and fails to get a new job, his old gang, the executive, and the people of the world rally together and beg him to stay, saying they love him and his show the way they are. The kids of America have loved you for years. Will you go back to your regular Saturday morning series? I'll do it for the kids. 
are my friends. What did he say? Like he'll do it for the kids, for his band! Oh, hooray! America's crying today! That's pretty wonderful. The creator's telling us why it's unnecessary to change what works. And it's so interesting to see how this lovely message over the years is sometimes totally ignored. That's okay. Scoob and the gang have since had practice dealing with Hollywood on this one. You made me sound like a total space cadet, man! I'm sorry if you're the way I was just, I was trying to be real to your character. If you like goof on me in the sequel, I'm coming after you! Yeah, then I'll give you a Scooby smile. Heavens to hilarity! This is it, sports fans! Participants even! So let's get on with it! Clap Olympic! It's funny that Warner Brothers thinks we need to establish a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe, don't worry, we're getting there, because for a long time, this was already a thing. There were a fistful of crossovers and ensemble shows bringing together the best of the HP lot, and we got it, we didn't need any further explaining. Yogi was usually in charge, and rightly so. As I've said before, I feel, even though he's not as famous as Scoob, he's the closest to representing the spirit of HP as a whole. Big dumb idiot bear. Filet mignon. Mmm, boy! I like lots of ketchup on my Philip McNonnies! So, Laugh Olympics is kinda weird, because it's really the only crossover to feature Scoob as a leading man. A d dog. Arf. In fact, it's extra weird, because Scooby wasn't usually invited to these events. And maybe there's a reason for that. God knows what Doggy Dad makes of him. This ain't no son of mine! This dog! It's eating off the floor! Perhaps this explains the harsh team divisions, with Yogi and the other uprighties against Scooby and the mystery-solving nerds. Only way Scooby Dumb's gonna get invited. He'd have the last laugh, though, because when they bundled up the show in a programming block, it was Scoob's name they'd use to front it. How else were they gonna get people to watch Not Wacky Races, even with all these other characters? Oh. Who did this? Was there any particular reason they had to make up all the villains? I mean, they're clearly redrawn versions of existing baddies. I, I don't see why Dick Dastardly and his crew, the Hooded Claw, Griswold and Jazz were off the table. You telling me Dr. Z wasn't invited? No, we gotta put up with Rando Octopus instead. Fish people. <laughs> oh, hello. There's probably more to say, but this ain't the place for it. Laugh Olympics ain't the Hair Bear Bunch or Top Cat or even the Herculoids, but you do get to hang out with Snagglepuss and, uh, imitation Paul Lind, even though they have actual Paul Lind. Mm. Remember, you silly savages, no hanky panky. As we all know, the Disney characters aren't allowed to show up just anywhere. The company's super protective of their public image, and you've got to know your stuff to get past that. Or sell ice cream. That seems to work. But in Hanna-Barbera's case, <laughs> they don't care. Why don't you mind your own f business, pal? I mean, maybe they sorta do now. Oh, we're getting there still. But from the 90s onwards, there were few boundaries on Hanna-Barbera properties. Adult Swim's early days dug into this, recognising those cartoons' core audience had grown up and letting the characters be a part of that. Not sure that Ha Ha Shag and Scoob smoke weed is the peak of its brilliance, of course, but Harvey Birdman was always less about the subject matter and way more about the delivery. How would you characterise your friend's odd behaviour? Um, when they get nervous, they laugh. And they're always hungry. That's it. Nothing further. I like to think this is the kind of thing that put us on the path to the Scoob and Shag series, though they'll probably never get animated thanks to all the other rights tangled up. Yeah, Betty Boop's husband might have a problem. Why is Bugs so good in these? Scoob, as the cultural touchstone, was the one who got the most exposure in the parody sector, through guest appearances, extended ads, and so much more. This goes double for the rest of the gang, including being able to track the decline of Fred Jones' psychological well-being as his failing relationships turn him slowly towards his van. Right now, ask me if you're watching, please call me. I left, oh, I don't know, maybe 134 messages. It's wild what they let the gang be a part of over the years, kickstarted by the absolutely brilliant Blair Witch parody, The Scooby Doo Project. This was dreamed up by some animators in need of promo bumpers, bringing together the cultural significance around that movie's hype and the Scooby franchise. Plenty to get out of what's going on here. Daphne, come back! Daphne, stop! It's just Scrappy-Doo! I know! I know! 
There's also unofficial parodies worth mentioning. The Venture Bros, which funnily enough uses some actual HP characters, has a pretty good one. This, like most Venture jokes, is multi-layered, the gang a combination of both Mystery Inc. and various real-life serial killers, one of whom, yes, thought his dog could talk. Just say something to him, just so they'll believe me. Not here to talk to them. You are the hand chosen by the master. No. Oh. I have to also admit to being low-key amused by Mike Tyson mysteries. I mean, <laughs> that man is not okay. It's an old IBM computer punch card. It's written in binary. Oh, for deaf people. I think you mean braille, and that's for blind people, not deaf people. So deaf people have no language. Wow, that's pretty sad. No, they speak with their hands. Like monkeys. But the adult parody and crossover of choice everyone wanted me to talk about was Scooby Natural. Now, I've never watched Supernatural, and judging by what I saw, I, I think I'm good. Not bad or anything, just Archie's weird mysteries for the MySpace generation. But I did get into this. They clearly had fun putting it together, and it does play with Scooby history in a smart way. Their possessed television doesn't only transport them into the world of Scooby-Doo. The brothers... Grimm? Karamazov? Via... <laughs> I didn't catch the names, end up in a specific episode, which starts to go wrong and lead to all sorts of twisty shenanigans. They play it absolutely right, having the characters on script until they just can't be anymore, giving the gang a chance to finally crack. If there are ghosts, that means there's an afterlife! Heaven! Hell! Am I going to hell? I don't think it's quite as crazy as people told me, but it's a great example of how to adapt another show's voice to your own, helped out by Brother 2's hilarious devotion to Scooby Cannon. Scooby Doo could die, and that's not happening, not on my watch take a bullet for that dog. I think what people dig is the statement that Scoob is so widespread, even Supernatural's excited to interact with it and be part of the ride. Other shows gotta pick up the slack now. Tell me you don't want Breaking Barn, come on. Alright, so uh, I didn't include this in the last video and people got mad, but I promise you there was a reason. My original video was about key iterations that scaled the classic tenets of the Scooby formula. Ooh. But what New Scooby Do doesn't really scale anything, which is not a criticism. It's more obvious if you see its roots in the Legend of the Vampire movie. After reuniting the gang at last in the Zombie Island film, the director video movies got successively tamer. And this was the drop off point, as it puts the gang back in their classic outfits and audio cues, as well as making the monsters fake again. Inexplicably, this one has audio commentary with Shag, Scoob, and Fred. Classic insights to be found there, no doubt. Wow. What? It's just Daphne. It was clearly paving the way for a new TV show, banking on the audience the recent movies had brought back. When putting the first video together, I thought it wouldn't help my point, so I left it out. And did I get an earful about that in the comments? I stand by the decision, but I do regret not saying something. And I think my sister had a good argument in its favour. All right. So it wasn't as big and crazy as the new movies, but you know what? It brought classic Scoob back. Baby! <laughs> Thank you Can so you... much. Good <laughs> She's right, you know. I loved What's New. Watched it religiously as a kid. And it's a reintroduction to television that doesn't mess around. It's the purest continuation of the 60s original, and while there are updates to reflect the times, the title is kind of ironic, as if the response is, well, <laughs> not much, actually. Sorks! Yeah. Jeepers! Jinkies! Dang, I still don't have a catchphrase. It wasn't a major shake-up or terribly well made, but it gave us more of what we'd missed, the comfort food that kept us entertained. And it did try to evolve the concept within the original shape. The gang's new outfits were a nifty nudge towards modernity that felt appropriate, the characterization got closer to the stuff we see all the time in the movies and shows now, the villains in later episodes trying to play with our expectations, and a couple subtle callbacks got peppered in here and there. Seems like the writers were having a lot of fun making official new Scooby adventures and pushing the jokes enough to show that they <laughs> they knew what they were doing. I hope you enjoy the special dish I ordered in Italian. I never thought I'd see Scooby-Doo jump the shark. I'm 18, able to legally vote. In that sense, I think it's better served in this video, as a commentary on Scooby's endurance between events. While the show didn't last past three seasons, it did become a bunch of extended episodes in direct-to-video movies itself, as well as run on TV in absolute perpetuity. So, contrary to the lyric, no child is ever going to wonder where Scooby's gone. Like the original show, this preps them for similar TV staples in later life, Murder, She Wrote, Diagnosis Murder, or the other whodunit franchise they got on screen in the 60s. Watch out for the cat! Yeah! I never wanted to be 
a janitor. We acknowledged the live-action Scoobies in the previous video, but not the spin-offs, and there's a simple answer to why. They aren't very good. Nothing offensive, they're merely not as interesting as the side projects in every other medium. Unless they're staged. Mystery Scooter! Hanna-Barbera has been doing the whole stage show thing for decades. I should know. My dad has Barney Rubble and Ranger Smith in his credits. I, uh, guess HB's in the blood. And you can dig up a lot of these online. Right down to their own ice capades. And of course, Jabberjaw is there. Prick. So it should be no surprise that Scoob events get done all the time, on an international scale. He's done stage performances, theme parks, college orientation videos. More actors have probably played these parts than some of our greatest playwrights' creations. Slim Shaky got nothing on Scoob. So many done in this country for starters, I remember ads for them all the time. There's one from a holiday camp in Skegness I stumbled on. Uh, for the Americans in the audience, Skegness is uh, like the showbiz end of the world. I saw the Chuckle Brothers there once, who incidentally we saw out the back of the theatre having a ciggy before the show, passing it back and forth to me, to you, to me, to you. <laughs> they waved. That was a good day. Where was I? Oh yeah. I tried to watch this and all I could hear were the kids. But this is the crazy thing about Scoob, right? That someone at any given moment has brought him to life in our material world, and people will always be there to watch. Pfft, forget the Joker. You want evidence of the ubiquity of a fictional character's mythos and how indelible it is within our society? Take a look in your local directory and see who's staging some Scooby magic when it's next available. The idea of all of these shows is quite lovely, but if I had to make a choice as to what to watch, <laughs> I think the college one was the best. <laughs> Jeepers! What is it? I love this dress. Yeah, that is nice. Well, I want to give this a go. Make a new Scooby show. Nay, a musical worthy of the dog. Go on, hit me up, HP. I've no credited experience, but judging by these, I'm starting to think that's not an issue. Oh, Freddy. Yeah? <gasps> oh, Scooby! Gross! <laughs> <laughs> Last time we talked about a couple of the director video Scooby movies, but I don't think I gave the right impression of how many there are. Since Zombie Island, there's been one almost every year, and naturally, I'd missed a few that people recommended I go back and check. Was it worth it? <laughs> Dude, can I borrow your shades? No! <laughs> yeah. While Frank and Creepy feels the most quintessentially Scooby, still a very special movie, the films around it in that upswing period try other genre concepts akin to our first entry, commenting on Scoob against our wider field of media reference, and a couple of them get very creative. Moon Monster Madness is a send-up of modern sci-fi, mostly alien. Goes for some crater-sized awkward humour and a lot of hairplay. Hairplay for days. Music of the Vampire attempts to do a full musical, attempts, but the better choice is Stage Fright. A little gem from the creative director of Mystery Incorporated, Victor Cook, producing a different kind of Scooby film with a great sense of humour that, believe it or not, tackles the Fred and Daphne thing. Kind of ironic, really. Perhaps most visually impressive was the Kiss crossover, and I have to tell you, when I saw this on the shelf at Tesco, I wasn't ever expecting it to look like, well, this. It's an experience. While a totally self-serving advert for the group and their brand of crazy, band of crazy more like, yeah, sick dude. This also means it's a heavily funded visual treat, scene after scene of insanely well-made sequences that, on occasion, made me snort. It's a very funny time. The madness builds until we're sent on a colossal odyssey of triptastic proportions into the outer planes of existence. Through the rockinest Jack Kirby tribute ever put to film, my god, it just keeps going has to be seen and between you and me you got to get toasted on the good stuff yeah that's the ticket i know there are others yeah yeah they're okay too camp scare has great atmosphere and a much more straightforward creepy mystery abracadabra do is remember my gem video <laughs> paul and misty are at it again there's a brave and the bold crossover film blue falcon parody lego puppet scooby does fine in all these scenarios but even after that i think one stuck with me the most
I realised, and only because I'd gotten the reference thanks to another video I had to research, that this was a spoof of the Valley of Guanji movie, where dinosaurs start roaming around a city in Mexico. Of course, being Scooby, they're ghost dinosaurs, which sort of tells you the movie's tone, aka good. There's an L. Ron Hubbard stand-in, some ghost trick cosplayers show up, <laughs> plenty of freeze frame material. There was only one major reason people wanted me to see this though, and you know what? The memes don't do it justice. <laughs> It's not that he's just so powerful, it's, it's not that. It's the freaking attitude he cops. Trouble approaches and he's got this smug ass smile. And then there's the poses, just stop. <laughs> Words will never, I, I can never, just, just go watch it, okay? But what Phantasaur does is real clever, playing on the structure of the usual Scooby mystery in ways I don't want to spoil, and giving everyone something different to do, lots of great gags. I, I don't know how spicy it is to call it a favourite, but my take is that even if the film doesn't have the visual flair of Kiss, or the gimmicks of Stage Fright, or Moon Monster, it does a fantastic job of telling the story of a classic, small-town Scooby mystery in a new and entertaining way, and for that, I think it's the benchmark you'd hope most of the movies would hit. Oh yeah, we also get the funniest variation on the whole Velma dating thing. I forget sometimes, uh, <laughs> how good her batting average is. Daphne only gets the one movie, I guess. She's at home crying with the lights out, <laughs> Fred's in the shed. <laughs> Could be a lot worse. Stop it, Shaggy. I'm not stupid. Are you cheating on me? Another version everyone was desperate for me to mention was the Scooby Apocalypse comic, and well, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, a, a ringing endorsement, I'm sorry. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the Hanna-Barbera comics, not because I don't enjoy the idea of the characters being updated or whatever. I mean, that's why I love the Flintstones title, an outrageously funny update written by someone looking to tap into their failures, which, perhaps intentionally, reminds me why I find the Flintstones so funny anyway. I read an article once that said you should dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So how long have you been wearing that tie? Fifteen years. On the other hand, the Wacky Races one is just what if this was Mad Max, and that's the joke. If that aesthetic works for you, then great, but it doesn't go much further for me. Scooby Apocalypse is, I guess, in the middle. If you're the kind of person who's ever written preparing for the zombie apocalypse on your dating profile, this probably seems hilarious, a crazy Scooby take. I think the reason I prefer the other comics is that they're so savagely satirical, whereas this wants you to earnestly invest in its story, which, okay, is kind of the joke. I'm telling Bladsky I'm quick effective immediately and no 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 don't look at me like that you can't really expect me Ruff to you. I don't care if you wait did you just talk Ruff. oh man I really should have read those contracts rhyme a dog <laughs> It's not a bad story though. The dialogue's written by J.M. Dematius, who wrote some of my favourite Spider-Man comics in the 90s, and there's a bit of a 90s voice to this. A lot of word balloons and upfront feelings, a couple sly jokes, it's comfy. The idea of an outbreak creating messed up versions of monster cliches is neat. They do full arcs drawing from aspects of the characters that wouldn't otherwise be explored, and they even, for the scrappy apologists, bridge the gap between what we got in the movie and what his fans would rather see. That's kind of sweet. It gets rushed towards the end, and many of the new characters don't have much going for them, but at 36 issues with a definitive ending, if this looks like your thing, you could do worse than read it. But these aren't the only Scooby comics. There's a ton of great stuff to be found out there, especially if you want the real Scooby-verse. I remember some of the best stories I used to collect as a kid, my personal favourite being one built around an episode's chase music. Was also kinda cool when they started crossing over with DC superheroes. Uh, let's open a random page. What's this? Velma unmasking a Hitler youth. A what? I'll have a napkin and some hand sanitizer. Whoa, man! It's Simon Cowell! In the, the chest! chest. 
<laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Scoob's not exactly a disappointment, if only because I think most people could see it wasn't going to work. It doesn't remove the fact that there are a great deal of good Scooby movies already out there or do anything irrevocably damaging to the franchise. There's no threat posed here. What it does show is how easy it is now for an animated movie to pretend like it's one of the big guns, walking, talking, and acting like it's anywhere near its peers, using some of the best artists in the business while being entirely hollow on the inside. Harry Potter? I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, obviously. Which house is she in? Hufflepuff? She's a Supreme Court Justice. Oh, Slytherin. <laughs> Scoob has serious talent behind its visuals. Every now and then there's something nice to look at or a bit of movement that's like, yeah, okay, solid. Couple neat design choices. There's cheeky references here and there. I imagine the environment artist snuck in. Hey, look, he got it. But you can tell these guys aren't working towards any great single idea, no greater shared concept of what this movie is supposed to embody. And maybe part of this is, well, that it's a cinematic universe movie instead of a Scooby movie. I want to redefine that. A lot of the blame is pointed at the MCU, which I get, but it's cribbing more from the Wreck-It Ralph Lego Movie Spider-Verse concept. Those cases worked because, in spite of all the references that show up, they're purposefully chosen to express one idea. The Lego Movie, anyone can create. Spider-Verse, anyone can wear the mask. Ralph, anyone can be Steve Brawl. You live alone. These celebrate their franchise's relationships to their audience. They mean something. Scoob doesn't mean anything, yet tries to do so much. We get the origin of Scoob and Shag, we get the origin of the Mystery Gang, then we suddenly split them up and introduce Dick Dastardly and these other characters and plot revelations and it keeps talking at you, then when it's done piling on exposition it throws in jokes based on Twitter templates and buzzwords like that's gonna be enough. Toxic masculinity! Simon Cowell, that's the celebrity you got out of all of these? An army of robots? Is, is this the Postman Pat movie? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, that movie's funny. It's a classic example of the plot driving the characters, emotional beats happening because they're expected to happen. And to say this is the most manufactured Scooby movie, well, it's bad news. It's not only the stuff you've seen done better in other movies, it's the stuff you've seen done better in other Hanna-Barbera or Scooby media, all watered down. Quit putting filters on your selfies and get in the game. Whoa, whoa, what do you think I'm doing? I'm putting my social media feelers out there, Dino Butt. Should I need to sacrifice any of you to get my prey? I'll gladly do it. <laughs> oh, BF. <laughs> He's not kidding either. World ending prophecy where Scoob's history's integral? Mystery Incorporated. The gang solving mysteries as kids? Pup named Scooby Doo. A group of Hanna Barbera characters teaming up to take on Dick Dastardly? Fun, 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 fun. Fantastic. They do the van thing, they do the ascot thing, and neither are as fun as the other time. You know, the, uh, the good times. It's hardly even fan service. Any references made to the past are half-hearted or skin deep. Right down to the way that Velma, Fred, and Daphne now function as one person, constantly commenting on the way they do stuff instead of, like, doing it. Dare I even begin to get into the controversy around the recast voice actors, or rather the complete lack of damage control on Warner Brothers' part, which doesn't make me any more comfortable with these very tame vocal choices. Even Frank Welk is being directed off Scooby. It's like they're afraid of being Scooby. The robots attack this talking dog and a gangly dude that had this habit of using the word like at the start of every sentence. Almost as if he was a middle-aged man's idea of how a teenage hippie talks. There's no faith in the source material, no feeling that any of those characters were inherently fun to play with, even though there are other modern examples of how to delve into new angles with those guys that build on why we find them fun. Like the guy Jason Isaacs plays here, he's okay, but he's not Dick Dastardly. He's, he sounds more like Phantom Limb, actually. You should uh, get him for the Venture movie. Yeah, Dastardly's name is Dick. You got your gift set. That was funny for what, a week? Bruh, I watched that meme evaporate in real time. It was... So satisfying. I could go on, but I think Scoob's superficiality speaks for itself. Much like the Sonic movie, as shown in a pitch video, it's clear they were full steam on a different design for the lead boys, more in keeping with how the rest of the gang looks, also indicating the crossover stuff was always intended, an idea they were trying to get off the ground when that approach seemed a lot more bankable. <laughs> so possibly what they did was decide to change only Scoob and Shag after audience testing to get people to feel good enough about picking up a ticket, which you think would make them ask why take an approach that tenuous 
strenuous to begin with. Like Sonic, changing the surface of the work doesn't fix the basic lack of care in crafting any kind of narrative with faith in the world it's drawing from, which some have gotten a bit complacent about since other franchise movies made it look so easy. In spite of all these attempts to bring Scooby to the modern age, it is entirely antithetical to what has made Scooby relevant for so long. We began this list with everyone begging Scooby to go back to what we love him for, and we end with Scooby trying to avoid it at all costs. And that's not great. This, Freddy would reject. It would not be taught in schools. But I'd hate to leave on a sour note. There's got to be some sign that Scoob is going to be alright. 2020 saw the release of Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo, a special directed by Maxwell Adams, creator of the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy. And it kicks ass. <laughs> Oh, I'm so pleased about this. No tricks, just treats. Even after all the cool surprises we've seen today, as well as recent disappointments, oh no, Happy Halloween is still totally different from anything that's come before, a weird, wonderful bit of nonsense, and that's definitely down to its creator. Atoms has always had a kind of detached quality to his work, a special rhythm. It's like a balloon bobbing along until it suddenly bursts with an insane cackle. <laughs> That feeling hangs all over this one, bubbling with distorted energy and barely suppressed insanity that seems like it could snap at any moment, which it often does. So fun. It's the first Halloween-specific Scooby film in a while, and it goes all out on that theme, around a host of famous movie loglines and some extremely involved cameos, one of which is way more integral than I think anyone expected. Reminds me of this comic, anyone else? And the best part is it's in keeping with what makes Scooby great. There's an interview where Atoms discusses going back and binging not just his favourite Scoobs from growing up, but all the different Scooby shows, picking the bits he liked and throwing them in where useful, like setting it in Crystal Cove to offer some backing to the mystery using celebrity cameos as dramatic foils for his leads, and utilising edges of crazy Daphne's persona from the Be Cool series to best express his sense of humour. I, for one, am happy to have that dead-eyed lunatic back in the front seat. Well, when it's time to wash an owl, and you wish that you had a towel, but you don't have a towel, so you got to use your sweater. Bang, 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 ding, 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 ding. As far as I'm concerned, this is how you do it. Tugging at threads from across the Scoobyverse to see what unravels makes the final product seem like it's it's part of the grand plan, and what a mad plan it is. This is a party, a proper Halloween bash, and going from the least entertaining adventure to the most is the best way to prove that this dog is so far from done. Get on chat with your buddies, tell them it's time to rock, cause this, <laughs> this is something else. So I found this low-budget movie that I started watching, and I thought it was worth talking about here, because it's weird that nobody's mentioned it before. I mean, I'm a fan of low-rent stuff, it always amazes me what people will come up with to pay tribute to a franchise they like, and I've always wanted to try and work- Ooh. Wait, is this- are they- are they about- oh, oh no! Thanks for watching, everyone! Huge thanks to my patron backers who have known something like this was on the cards for a while. Glad I could finally get it done and out there. Keep us all occupied, yeah? I have no idea if I'll do this again. Uh, I think I'm tapped out on Scooby material I want to discuss, but you never know what'll come up in the future. Maybe there'll be something, either way. Uh, feel free to check out the other stuff I've created, and until then, I'll catch you all to some other place in another universe with the big dog. Oh, I missed out the video games. Uh, it's fine.